Welcome. I'm truly delighted that you're joining us for the third edition, the disarmament orientation course for newly arrived diplomats here in Geneva. And Geneva is at the forefront of multilateral diplomacy, and it has, of course, a long tradition of diplomats, scientists, civil society and the UN all working together to find new ideas for a safer world. We hope to build on this tradition and we're proud to host you for this interactive, engaging and we hope stimulating course that will provide you with background and resources on multilateral disarmament diplomacy that will introduce you to some of the key institutions and components of the disarmament machinery. And that will give you an opportunity to meet and engage with your new colleagues here in Geneva. Last year, due to the global pandemic, instead of canceling this course, we changed our tack and moved it online. And although it is a challenge to foster the normal in person contacts and dialogues that are so essential in our field, we received positive feedback on this virtual format and will do our utmost to facilitate another engaging and interactive course again for you this year. COVID-19 has revealed major cracks and systemic fragilities and tensions in our world. And in few areas, perhaps, are these more evident than in the fields of arms control and disarmament. Galloping advances in technology are happening as we speak, and unrelenting shifts in the nature of warfare are stretching potential battlefields from cyberspace to outer space. Now, all of this has once again placed disarmament and arms control as key priorities on the international peace and security agenda. And as multilateral disarmament is becoming ever more urgent, it is also becoming more and more challenging. Now, I'm very pleased that the High Representative for Disarmament Affairs, Izumi Nakamitsu, in her opening remarks will provide more details on the broader global security environment and its ramifications for multilateral disarmament. So what are the goals and objectives of this course and what will it cover? The goal of the course really is in the name. We want to provide you with orientation, equip you with the ability to navigate a dynamic and increasingly challenging field. Multilateral disarmament has become a massively broad and very complex area. Over the years, the disarmament agenda has constantly expanded it includes weapons of mass destruction for sure, but also a wide range of conventional weapons and rapidly evolving, potentially game changing new technologies in the realms of cyber, artificial intelligence and outer space. This is not to mention the wider linkages between disarmament and broader issues such as conflict prevention, peace building or sustainable development. Now, what adds to the complexity is that the issues you're dealing with in disarmament they're often politically sensitive, technically complex, and sometimes highly complex, and they're frequently rooted in long-standing political debates and commitments. They come with their own history, so to say. Uh, they come with their own jargon, vocabulary, and surely a new list of unpronounceable acronyms. Now, all of this can be quite daunting for anyone who's entering the field for the first time, for sure. And for all of these reasons, our course offers you a broad mapping of a range of substantive issues, a tour d'horizon of the core treaties and instruments underpinning our disarmament efforts, and a comprehensive overview of the relevant institutions, arms control bodies, tools and mechanisms, and with a primary focus, particular focus on those that are based here in Geneva. Now, throughout the course, we'll also focus on the current challenges facing uh, multilateral disarmament efforts in today's complicated global security environment. And we will draw your attention to a repository of educational resources that are available for practitioners. Last but certainly not least, we want, you to, want to introduce you to our experts who are here to support you, uh, and not just for this course, but also well beyond and during your entire time in Geneva. UNODA and UNIDEA are here to help. We really are. Now, turning to the content uh, of the course, and as I said, the primary focus is on Geneva-based disarmament instruments and negotiations. And uh, given that this is a very broad area, we've split the course up into six different modules. Now, we'll kick things off in module one with a scene-setting exercise that will help you situate disarmament diplomacy within the broader global political and security environment, with which disarmament is, of course, inextricably interlinked. In module two, we'll then turn to weapons of mass destruction, consider key issues and treaties in nuclear disarmament and non-proliferation, 
provide an overview of the opportunities and the challenges facing the 10th NPT review conference and help you understand trends, dynamics, frameworks related to biological and chemical weapons. Now, I said before that disarmament can be quite technical, um, but there are also a range of broader cross-cutting issues affecting all areas of disarmament, gender representation, or gendered perspectives on disarmament, or financing aspects for multilateral disarmament processes. These cross-cutting issues will be the focus of module three. Next, and this is module four, we want to address the broad issue area of conventional weapons. There's quite a list of core treaties to be considered here, starting with the convention on certain conventional weapons, the anti-personal mine ban convention, the cluster munitions uh, convention, the arms trade treaty, and then of course, broader issues such as explosive weapons in populated areas. In module five, uh, we want to turn to the challenges for multilateral governance of space, missiles, and related technologies. And then in concluding, in concluding, and this is module six, we'll explore how multilateral processes can contribute to security challenges, uh, to addressing security challenges posed by digital transformation and emerging information and AI technologies. Now, besides learning about these very substantive issues, we also encourage you to actively engage and interact with the experts and speakers whom you'll meet throughout this course. And of course, to use this course as an opportunity to network with your new uh, colleagues. Our goal is, by the end of this course, to provide you with a sort of a map, a guidebook to disarmament in Geneva, so that you can begin to familiarize yourself with the relevant tools, resources, institutions, and processes that you will be engaging with. Now, speaking of institutions, UNIDIR is, of course, one of these institutions. We play a unique and vital role in multilateral disarmament. UNIDIR is an autonomous institution within the United Nations that conducts independent research on disarmament and related international security issues. And our research, analysis, and convening activities aim to promote the informed participation by all states in multilateral disarmament. Now, to this end, uh, the UNIDIR pursues four core programs of work in the fields of conventional weapons weapons of mass destruction, security and technology, and gender and disarmament. And in addition, and as part of a special regional project, the Institute also explores past efforts and prospects for a Middle East zone free of weapons of mass destruction. The Institute's programs are designed as dynamic, multidisciplinary, scalable work streams to enable us to reflect the disarmament priorities of a diverse international community. And they allow UNIDIA to adapt its research agenda and to deliver cutting edge research in a dynamically evolving global security environment. Now, let me say that at any point, we value and welcome your feedback on any aspect of this course. All of us at UNIDIA and UNODA are very much looking forward to working with you during your entire time here in Geneva. Let me close by thanking our generous core budget donors. Without their support and contribution, this value course would not be possible. And I'm now very pleased to invite the High Representative to deliver her remarks. On behalf of the United Nations Office for Disarmament Affairs, or UNODA, I would like to welcome you to the 2021 edition of this orientation course for diplomats in Geneva working on disarmament. I'm thrilled to see more and more participants attending the course each year. I trust that this initiative meets your needs as it aims to build a common understanding of disarmament processes and issues that you will be negotiating in the making of multilateralism. As last year, we have preferred to meet in person, but we have worked hard to make the most of the online format for you to interact and build networks, relationships, and partnerships. Achieving concrete disarmament objectives will require knowledge and skills. Amidst a difficult and evolving environment, complex disarmament agendas are shaping collective action to mitigate new risks the need of participants in multilateral processes for, for knowledge, up-to-date information and expert analysis is palpable. Quality education underpins global security 
and is a fundamental objective of the Sustainable Development Goals. Multilateral disarmament is at a precipice. Secretary General Guterres launched his agenda for disarmament in 2018, out of concern that the world was letting drifting towards unconstrained arms competition, disrespect for principles of humanity, and failure to adapt to risks posed by rapidly developing technology. Now in 2021, the diminished appetite for collective action and application of the international norms in disarmament, exacerbated by the COVID-19 pandemic, underscores the critical importance of this agenda and why the tools of disarmament remain both indispensable and underutilized. Three intersecting developments affect multilateral disarmament. The first is what I see as a return to Cold War style mindsets about the utility of nuclear weapons. Rhetoric about nuclear war fighting is increasingly common and is coupled with expensive nuclear weapon modernization campaigns. We have moved to a qualitative nuclear arms race based not on numbers, but on faster, stealthier, and more accurate weapons. The second development relates to the way in which the global security landscape has shifted. We see the re-emergence of strategic tension amongst many major powers, challenges to international norms and possible extension of armed conflict into new domains through transformative technologies. Without appropriate guardrails, these revolutionary technology advances have the potential to contribute to global instability and challenge existing legal frameworks. A third development is what the Secretary General has described as a trust deficit disorder, styming the um, multilateral disarmament machinery. The institutions created to safeguard our collective security and to negotiate the next steps in arms control and disarmament are paralyzed. Arms control agreements painstakingly constructed through the Cold War are collapsing. The inability of the international community to negotiate new instruments undermines faith in multilateral institutions as a means of constraining armed conflict. We need effective disarmament diplomacy more than ever. The world remains overarmed, undermining trust and confidence. The global circulation of small arms and light weapons is now estimated at around 1 billion. While the global military spending has reached to its highest levels in a decade, the COVID-19 pandemic has given new urgency to governments to redirect resources towards mitigating the humanitarian impact of conflict and economic recovery. Despite the Secretary General's call for global ceasefire over a year ago, arms continue to flow to volatile regions, further fueling violence, conflict, and suffering for some of the world's most vulnerable populations. The use of explosive weapons in populated areas has left healthcare systems of entire societies bereft for the means to combat the pandemic. COVID-19 also refocused our attention to low probability risks with global consequences, in particular, the world's preparedness to respond to deliberate biological incidents. In this volatile context, several key disarmament and arms control conferences are approaching, including review conferences for the MPT, BWC, and CCW. 
those important events will need to set the direction for our multilateral disarmament efforts over the next five years and beyond. We need to embrace new ways of working together while finding common grounds. Our objective is to embed disarmament in not only efforts to achieve sustainable peace, but as a mutually beneficial means to achieving the sustainable development goals and fostering comprehensive approach to prevention. Only with your support can we be successful. We need your skills, dedication, professionalism, and persistence if we are to match the challenges of the 21st century. UNODA is here to support you in this task. UNODA works towards the elimination of weapons of mass destruction and the strict control of conventional weapons. To this end, we promote norm setting and multilateral agreements in the areas of disarmament, arms control and non-proliferation, facilitate dialogue amongst diverse stakeholders and advocate for concrete and effective solutions to support sustainable peace and development. UNODA in Geneva provides the substantive secretariats for most of the disarmament regimes and works closely with the chairs and other office holders to prepare for meetings and conferences and to move processes forward. It also supports groups of governmental experts and other processes established by the UN General Assembly to examine, discuss, and formulate recommendations on key disarmament and arms control issues. UNODA encourages what Secretary General Guterres calls um, networked and inclusive multilateralism. It fosters disarmament measures through dialogue, transparency, and confidence building on military matters and encourages regional disarmament efforts. It also pushes for a more inclusive disarmament field by engaging with different groups, including women and youth, and putting people at the center of disarmament efforts. UNODA provides a considerable institutional repository of knowledge developed for member states and available also to the wider United Nations system and the public at large. And UNODA is here for you. Please get in touch with Geneva branch staff if you have any questions or would like to discuss any matter. I hope you will have an enriching, informative and interactive experience and look forward to working with you as we join together to achieve the realization of human, national and international security through the regulation, control and elimination of arms. I thank you very much for your attention. Hello and welcome. I would like to welcome you to this year's Disarmament Orientation course. My name is Oliver Meyer and I'm Senior Researcher at the Berlin Office of the Institute for Peace Research and Security Policy at the University of Edinburgh. I'm this year's course coordinator and I will guide you through the videos as well as the interactive sessions of this course. This is the third Disarmament Orientation course and it's unfortunately the second time that this course has to take place in an online format due to the pandemic. You are watching the video for the first of six modules in this course. And as you will notice, we are reusing some of the video material from last year's orientation course, which means in some of the videos you will see Richard Lennon, who was the course coordinator last year. The interviews he has conducted are timeless and um, really good. As you will see, however, there are occasionally references to the previous year or last year. Um, so don't be confused if, this, uh, re if these references are not up to date. 
While you watch the videos, I would like to encourage you to note any questions or comments you might have on the specific topics that are being addressed and to bring up these points during the interactive sessions. These videos primarily are supposed to prepare you for the interactive discussions. And it would be fantastic if you can bring your questions with you for that part of the course. I would also like to encourage you to take a close look at the reading list on the course website. We have identified some core readings for every topic, for every issue that is on the agenda, which you should read in preparation for the interactive part. And then in addition, there's a whole host of other resources which you can take a look at and should take a look at if you're particularly interested in any of the topics that we discussed. Last but not least, um, do use this course to touch base with uh, UNIDEAR and UNODA staff, and experts that you will meet in the videos and particularly during the interactive sessions. We very much hope that this course provides an opportunity for you to get a lay of the land and to understand better who may be of help to you while you're working on these issues during your posting to Geneva. So here in this first video, you will see Richard Lenin talk to Tim Corley, who is one of the most senior experts on multilateral disarmament, has a lot of experience on these issues, and um, was head of the Geneva branch of UNODA, and also New Zealand's disarmament ambassador. Richard and Tim will set the scene for the more specific discussions. They will discuss the multilateral disarmament machinery and some of the challenges it is facing. So let's get started. So Tim, can you tell us a little bit about the history of the CD, where it came from, how it came to be, uh, what its purpose is and what, what has it achieved? Sure. Well, thank you very much, Richard. And uh, it's very good to, to be here and to have this opportunity to, um, to contribute to, to this course. Um, on the conference uh, on disarmament and, and its history, I think the, the first thing to, the first point to make is that nuclear disarmament was the subject of the very first resolution um, adopted by the UN General Assembly in 1946. But at a subsequent lack of progress on this issue um, led in 1978 to the convening by the UN General Assembly of a special session devoted to um, disarmament, uh, a, a meeting that was that has the acronym UNSSOD1, and I'll refer to it um, as that uh, in, in my comments. Um, UNSSOD1 um, established a, a committee on disarmament, um, and that committee, which is a precursor um, to the CD comprised 40 states and was established as a single multilateral disarmament negotiating forum of the international community. Now in its consensus resolution, the special session um, made clear that the accumulation of weapons, particularly nuclear weapons, uh, constituted much more a threat than a protection uh, for mankind. Prior to uh, this decision in, in 1978, disarmament negotiations had been conducted in various configurations, including committees of as few as 10 members. Uh, and then since 1962, um, a committee of 18, chaired jointly by the United States and the former uh, Soviet Union. These were groupings really just of military powers um, rather than uh, a cross section of the broader international community. And this is why the non-aligned movement attached much importance to the more representative membership of 40 states agreed uh, by consensus at um, the special session on disarmament. Uh, at its um, initial session in 1979, the, the newly established negotiating body, what we know now as the uh, Conference on Disarmament or the CD, 
agreed a list of issues for its future work uh, on the cessation of the arms race and disarmament. And top of this list of 10 subjects, um, often referred to as the Decalogue, was nuclear weapons in all its aspects. Now, um, uh, the CD's history, um, that is a, a brief account of uh, how it really began in its more or less current guise, um, but uh, it, in, its, in its history to date, uh, it's uh, had the um, various successes and, and produced six uh, major multilateral um, arms limitation and disarmament agreements, um, including um, the Non-Proliferation of Nuclear Weapons Treaty, the NPT, um, the NMOD and Seabed Treaties, the Biological Weapons Convention, the Chemical Weapons Convention, and the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty. So what's the current role and structure of the CD? What's it supposed to be doing now? What's on the agenda? Well, it was set up as a negotiating body, um, and it now uh, comprises 65 states up from the 40 um, uh, from the special session time. Um, and it's a negotiating body in contrast to the UN Disarmament Commission and the first committee of the UN General Assembly that are deliberative forums, venues for developing understandings at most rather than negotiating legally binding treaties and, uh, and, and they comprise all members of the United Nations. Um, the last negotiations carried out in the CD were from 1994 to 1996 to develop the CTBT um, treaty, the testing, banning the testing of nuclear weapons. And I should notice as an aside that the CD is not restricted to negotiating treaties only. Um, if its members agreed, the CD could, for example, negotiate international understandings of, of less than treaty status. But since 1996, um, the conference has briefly begun negotiations uh, on banning fissile material, and on negative security assurances. Um, negotiations that began and ended uh, after only a matter of weeks in 1998, since when um, the conference has done uh, no more really in terms of negotiations than negotiate its, its annual report. Uh, as to the agenda, um, well, essentially since its first meeting, the, uh, the CD uh, regarded its mandate as covering practically all multilateral arms control and disarmament problems. Currently, however, uh, it primarily concentrates on four core issues, three of which relate uh, exclusively um, or primarily to the one remaining class of weapons of mass destruction, namely uh, nuclear weapons. So the core issues are nuclear disarmament, um, banning the production of fissile material for use in nuclear weapons, uh, assuring non-nuclear weapon states against the use or threat of use of uh, nuclear weapons, and uh, preventing an arms race in, in outer space. Um, lesser items on its agenda are three issues, uh, comprehensive disarmament, new types of weapons, and transparency in, in armaments. Now, the agenda is not to be confused or equated with the program of work, which is required to be negotiated and adopted at the beginning of each year also. And I'll come back to this distinction shortly. What's the relationship then of the CD to the United Nations um, and the First Committee in particular? Well, the CD, as we've seen, was established by the General Assembly of the UN um, to which the CD reports annually through the first committee of the General Assembly. And that committee deals with disarmament, global challenges and threats to peace uh, that affect the international community. First committee's purpose and is in essence to find solutions to, to challenges in the international security regime. Now the CD in adopting its agenda each year 
is bound by the General Assembly, bound by the UN General Assembly, to take into account the recommend, recommendations made to it by the General Assembly and the proposals presented by members of the First Committee. But in practical terms, the agenda of the CD changes very little, if at all, from year to year. I mean, if I can just um, pull to an extent some of these various bodies together in a, in a comment about um, the suggestion you might hear from time to time in the corridors, that greater efficiencies could be achieved if some kind of organic relationship could be forged among the First Committee, the UN Disarmament Commission and the CD. Um, for instance, uh, general deliberation of an issue would occur initially in the First Committee, and if the First Committee decided that it was an issue that warranted deeper discussions, it, it would be placed on the Disarmament Commission's agenda for more intense de deliberation. Then if after detailed consideration, the, the Disarmament Commission agreed, it would be referred to the CD for negotiation. You mentioned that the, the CD originally had a membership of 40 states, that's since increased to, to 65, but why is the membership restricted? Is that ever gonna change? And uh, uh, what about the countries that are not members? How can they best participate in the work of the conference? Well, it, its membership was a strict, restricted in the first place, ostensibly in order to make the negotiation process um, less unwieldy, uh, less complicated. But nowadays, um, this is seen as anomalous because all states have an interest in the security issues on the CD's plate. Um, and, uh, and all states, um, as it happens, uh, contribute to the costs um, of, the, uh, of operating the CD because it is funded through the UN budget um, by all members uh, of the United Nations. As, as for increasing its membership, I mean, this is indeed possible, um, provided, of course, that the CD uh, agrees to do so by consensus. But this is rather more difficult than it sounds. And, and indeed, the last occasion on which an increase in the CD's membership was agreed um, was as far back as 1995, when 23 new members were admitted up to the, the current level of, of 65. Um, so um, al although the, the current membership is, a, is a, so 65 states, another 30 or 40 or maybe more are admitted on application each year to, to non-member status. And they can submit proposals and participate in the discussion of those proposals. And they can, uh, upon request to and agreement by the conference, express views when matters uh, of particular concern to them are under discussion in the CD. Now, you said that the Conference on Disarmament is not engaged in negotiations since 1998, which is an awfully long time ago. What, what are the reasons for this blockage? I imagine it's, it's a complicated story, but what are the factors that are stopping the, the CD from, from getting back to work? And would you say there's any hope? Well, I think that there are uh, two main factors. Um, uh, one relates, well, they both stem um, from the, the rules of procedure. One of them relates to the program of work um, that I mentioned earlier in the context of, uh, of the agenda. Uh, and the other relates to the um, decision-making rule uh, consensus. But let me deal um, with the, um, the program of work first. I mean, I think that uh, although the rules of procedure of the CD are sometimes blamed for inhibiting it, its work, it, in fact, um, the problem is, is not so much the rules themselves, um, but more the manner in which the members choose to apply them. Uh, after all, uh, today's rules serve satisfactorily in the negotiation in the now distant past for the six treaties that I mentioned earlier. But let me give an example of a misapplied rule that relates um, to the program of work which the CD is obliged by its rules to agree each year. And 
throughout these past um, two <laughs> unproductive uh, decades, um, the, uh, the practice of linking mandates for dealing with all four core issues within the program of work um, is at, at odds with the rules. I mean, the program of work needs to be no more than a schedule of activities for the year, um, you know, highlighting um, the point at which certain issues will come up for discussion, uh, the scheduling of the um, high-level uh, high segment and that kind of thing. There's no requirement for it to embody any mandates, uh, let alone um, link them. Now, mandates, of course, are required for each negotiation um, that the CD launches, but they don't have to actually be incorporated in the annual program of work. For as long as they are, and uh, going to your um, question as to whether there's any hope, for as long as they are, the CD's current approach um, will simply continue to tie it in an unnecessary knot. You know, um, and unraveling a knot, um, although it's within the power and the rules of the CD, um, requires uh, uh, the necessary um, political will of the members. Now, uh, the other point I was going to make is about the consensus rule, the CD's sole uh, decision-making rule. And um, this, there is, uh, often the argument made that it's this rule that complicates the um, uh, CD's ability to get itself out of its, of its current doldrums. But UNSSOD1 attached great importance um, to the participation of the nuclear weapon states and to ensure this participation decision making has to be by consensus, uh, that is the absence of a formal objection by any member. So this deliberately avoids situations, for example, where those nuclear armed states would find themselves in a minority outvoted, say, on matters affecting nuclear weapons. I mean, this simply wouldn't make sense. So, and in my view, the consensus rule is not in itself the reason for the CD's um, longstanding deadlock. Um, but because the consensus, because consensus is the sole decision-making rule, there's a responsibility on all members to apply it in a principled way. It shouldn't be treated as a blunt veto, but should be used sparingly, ideally only in situations where genuine and exhaustive efforts to, to seek consensus have been made and where a state's national interests would be palpably jeopardized. Now, some argue that the CD should only apply the consensus rule to matters of substance, but the difficulty of separating substance from procedure in relation to the weighty security topics on the CD's agenda means that it is unlikely that members would agree to finesse the consensus rule in that way, far less to incorporating additional decision-making rules. The Fissile Material Treaty or Fissile Material Cut-Off Treaty is often talked about as the logical next step for nuclear disarmament. What in particular, apart from the difficulties over the, the program of work, what are the factors that are stopping negotiations on a Fissile Material Treaty from, from getting started? Well sure, I think agreeing to, to prohibit the production of uh, the essential ingredients of a nuclear explosion, that is fissile materials, uh, it does seem like a logical next step um, towards certainly constraining, if not eliminating nuclear weapons. But there's a fundamental divergence on how to do this, um, or more particularly uh, as to the scope of, of such an agreement. Um, some nuclear weapon states, but not all, have ceased the production of fissile materials for their nuclear weapons. They've got enough for their needs but others are still building up their arsenals. Um, so this comes down to would an agreement um, prohibit only future production of fissile materials or should it also cover existing stocks, including those that are already in, in nuclear warheads? And the divergence um, 
on the scope of a prohibition is what's preventing a, a agreement on a negotiating mandate. Um, no consensus exists. It's interesting, though, that um, in this way of proceeding that the conference has been following for some um, years now, in terms of finding consensus on any of the three other core issues, uh, none of them has been really uh, tested because um, the, uh, the linked mandate issue um, has seen the, the um, program of work fail uh, just simply on the, the fissile material hurdle. And so, I mean, fissile material uh, is an important issue in its own right, but also in terms of the procedural uh, issues that um, are confronting the CD, um, it's at the center of, uh, of those as well. Over the 20 years that the CD has been paralyzed, there's an increasing number of disarmament treaties that have been negotiated elsewhere. And this includes the Anti-Personal Mine Ban Convention, the Convention on Cluster Munitions, the Arms Trade Treaty, and most recently, and perhaps controversially, the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, the TPNW. Uh, given that's the case and disarmament negotiations are proceeding, does the CD still matter? I mean, as, as I said earlier, the, the CD was, was set up as a single negotiating forum. Now this means that it's a standing body um, with its own secretariat that conduct that can, that can conduct negotiations sequentially on agreed topics under one roof with a dedicated secretariat. In the in this case, um, the United Nations Office of Disarmament Affairs. So in that sense, it's a convenient venue for disarmament negotiations, but it's not a, an exclusive one. It's not the sole forum. Uh, and it's true, as you say, that increasingly uh, states have turned to alternative uh, forums, either um, within the um, uh, within the United Nations General Assembly itself, um, or uh, through diplomatic conferences, such as those that produced the Anti-Personnel Mine Ban Convention and the uh, Cluster Munitions Convention. So you're right to ask, um, does the does the CD still matter? Um, I mentioned earlier that uh, the question of, of political will, and it's something you'll hear during debates in the CD states often lamenting the, the absence of political will amongst its members. But the problem is the clashing of political wills uh, and not their absence. Um, and some states want action and progress, but others, uh, prefer the status quo, um, and that is the divide uh, at the end of the day um, that uh, the members of the CD will have to overcome. Traditionally, of course, um, security issues take time to negotiate. Sadly, however, um, efforts to, to recognize and, and overcome the clash of, of wills in the CD haven't been very, uh, they haven't been pursued perhaps in the way that they, they ought to have been. Um, for instance, if, a, if serious backroom efforts are being made um, to break the impasse uh, at its root, then um, the, the new news of, of those efforts has to my, not come to, to my ears, admittedly, <laughs> a long way away uh, from the uh, uh, from the back rooms of the conference on disarmament, but it is uh, it is inevitably, I think, that um, in the CD's current uh, frozen state, um, that delegates states will look elsewhere for their forums for producing. Um, treaties or, or or understandings on the moments of the day on the issues of the day. Let's turn now to the rest of the disarmament machinery in the United Nations. You mentioned the first committee. There's also the disarmament commission. What's the role of these two bodies? Well, I think the in both cases um, the uh, de delegates 
from Geneva have often gone across um, the Atlantic to meetings, both of the first committee each October and to the uh, disarmament commission for a month in April. Well, now nowadays, of course, um, uh, travel to meetings is uh, not um, a current occupation, but um, in addition, um, the, the Disarmament Commission as a deliberative body, um, uh, in other words, a place for discussion rather than negotiation, um, has had relatively few um, successes in terms of its efforts uh, since it was established by, or, or since it was established very soon after the, the UN um, General Assembly itself. Um, and. Uh, there's not much more that can can be said. I don't think that both the first committee and the, the disarmament commission are places where um, essentially governments table resolutions on uh, moments of, uh, on issues of concern to them, uh, and those are discussed. And in the case of the first committee, um, decision making rules of the general assembly are applied um, to those uh, resolutions when they're put to a vote. Uh, in the disarmament commission decisions are, are taken um, as in the CD by consensus. But I'm, I, it's, it's hard to say how um, it, it'll differ, I think, from delegation to delegation as to the extent to which uh, delegates to um, Geneva will um, go to New York for the meetings of First Committee and the disarmament commission. As well as the forums for member states, we also have the, the UN agencies involved, uh, in particular UNIDIR, the United Nations Institute for Disarmament Research, and the UN Office for Disarmament Affairs, UNODA. What's the role of, of these two bodies? Well, um, as I mentioned earlier, um, UNODA uh, is the secretariat um, for the um, for the CD, and, uh, and, and that's just one of, of a number of roles it plays uh, in Geneva in relation to the various disarmament um, forums that are, are based um, there. Uh, their, their role is essentially to um, uh, help um, to assist the, the chairs of, uh, of those um, bodies, those forums, um, and to um, support the work of uh, member states um, at attending them to, to, um, uh, to, to, to help get the, the business of the, of the forums done. Um, UNIDARE's role is, uh, is somewhat different as a research um, uh, institute. Um, its work relates more to, um, uh, to providing um, the publications and the, um, the analysis uh, uh, on the issues that um, will confront delegates uh, in the various bodies <clears throat> that are based in Geneva and, and beyond of relevance, uh, and to, uh, to use its convening power as a, uh, as a UN um, agency um, to pull together workshops, um, uh, occasions like the, like the current one, which it is obviously doing in partnership with uh, UNODA, um, to give uh, uh, opportunities for informal discussion of issues, teasing uh, new issues out, um, issues relating, for instance, to technology re relevant to um, security issues, uh, and then generally, um, both ODA and UNIDARE uh, together actually um, contribute quite a lot of, of thinking to um, the work <clears throat> of the forums based in Geneva and, and beyond. Now, you, you talked about the General Assembly special session on disarmament back in 1978. There's been some discussion over the past few years about having a, a new special session on disarmament, which would be the fourth SSOD4, in fact. Uh, what are the reasons people are proposing that, and why are some others not, not happy about it? Um, the, the proposal for a fourth special session on, on disarmament, um, following the, the, the first successful one um, in, in 1978, which we talked about earlier, um, and 
two subsequent um, special sessions, neither of which are regarded, uh, regarded as having achieved very much, uh, goes back to 1995 and was essentially a, a proposal of the uh, non-aligned movement. Um, but it uh, has encountered, I think, some of the, the, the problems that uh, we're facing in, in getting agreement in the CD um, in, during, in, effectively, in the same the same period since the, the mid 1990s, um, a, a global security environment that's perhaps not um, conducive to being able to um, make progress on the kind of uh, issues that uh, a special session would um, would deal with, and um, it's. I think that the difficulty is that uh, there is just simply not a, a, a enough confidence that the um, special session would produce a, an outcome um, that would be uh, worthy of of the, of the effort that would go into it. Um, it's it, it's still on the. Um, being discussed in, in essentially in the first committee of the, um, the General Assembly uh, and, and there's been an open-ended working group set up by the um, General Assembly to um, discuss the objectives and, and an agenda and the possible need for a preparatory committee for a fourth special session. But the reality is that I don't think there's either um, sufficient um, confidence that it's going to make a difference um, or um, that there's uh, the kind of leadership that would be needed um, to, um, to bridge major differences in the current um, uh, global security um, environment. All right. Well, thank you, Tim, for that overview of, of the CD and the disarmament machinery. Turning back to our participants, we hope you found that useful. Please save your questions for the interactive discussion um, on module one, where Tim will be uh, will be chairing, and of course uh, you can ask your questions to him, and to the other panelists, will have you there.